Hi, hello and welcome back to F1 Challenge VB. My name is Mafesto and our journey through the history of Formula 1 continues today with the opening round of the 1964 season, the Monaco Grand Prix. And before I reveal the team that Andy Higgs will be driving for this season, let's take a look at the team and driver changes for the 1964 season. And we'll start as usual with Ferrari. Their lineup is the same as last year with Bandini, Scarfiotti and Sturtis at the wheel. There is a possibility though that Higgs will be joining Ferrari this season, in which case he would be replaced placing Scarfiotti. Cooper will have Bruce McLaren returning for another season and will be joined by Phil Hill who was left without a drive after ATS disbanded at the end of last season, whilst Tony Maggs will be joining the returning Scuderia Centro Sud alongside Baghetti who like Phil Hill was left without a drive after ATS disbanded. Owen Racing Organization will have the same lineup as before with Richie Ginther and Graham Hill, Equipe Marsberg and still have Dutchman De Beaufort as their driver, whilst Gerhard Mitter left to join Jim Clark over at Lotus, who will also have rookies Peter Arundel and Mike Spence driving for the team. Clark's ex-teammate Trevor Taylor will be moving over to BRP, joining NS Ireland. The lineup at Brabham Racing Organization stays the same as well, with Brabham himself and Dan Gurney at the wheel. Rec Parnell are returning for another season in Formula 1 and their lineup will consist of Chris Amon who drove for the team last season and rookie Mike Hillwood, whilst Hap Sharp will be joining Rob Walker's team alongside Joe Bonnier and rookie Edgar Barth. And Maurice Trintignant will be entering as a privateer. Joe Siffert will be returning as well and just like last year will be driving a privately entered car. Shiroko Palo Racing had a small change in name to Equipe Shiroko Belge and their driver will be returning Belgian André Pilet whilst Tony September will be retiring from racing for the time being. Tim Parnell Racing will not be returning this season, neither will their driver Maston Gregory, and we have a handful of new teams joining us on the grid this year. First off we have Peter Refsen driving as a privateer, Bernard Colomb also driving as a privateer, and then we have DW Racing Enterprises with Bob Anderson at the wheel. Honda Research and Development are also joining us in 1964, and they have a tough choice of drivers between rookie Ronnie Bucknam and 7 times world champion. Champion Andy Higgs. Former Formula 1 driver Bob Gerrard has formed his own team and has John Taylor as his driver. And last but not least we have John Wilmont Automobiles with Frank Gardner at the wheel. So those are the team and driver changes for the 1964 season and with all that said let's have a look at the poll results although I'm pretty sure you already know the answer to that. So there were a total of 46 voters, a decent enough number I guess. Anyway let's break it down and see which teams receive how many votes. Equipe Marsbergen, John Wilmont Automobiles, Joe Siffert Racing, Bob Gerard Racing, Scuderia Centro Sud, Rec Parnell Racing, DW Racing Enterprises, British Racing Partnership, RRC Walker Racing Team, Maurice Tintinia Racing Team, Bernard Colomb Racing and Equipe Chirocco Belge didn't receive a single vote. Peter Refsen Racing received one vote, Owen Racing Organization received two votes, Cooper Car Company and Team Lotus received four votes each, Brabham Racing organization received 5 votes making them the third most popular team. Ferrari had 10 votes and were the second most popular choice but the clear winner by a country mile was Honda Research and Development Company. They received 20 votes. And to be perfectly honest with you I am not even surprised that Honda is the winner. I have a feeling that most people voted for Honda based on their performance last year with McLaren which is kind of understandable I guess. The funny thing is, since 1964 was their first ever start in Formula 1, they didn't perform all that well, especially if we consider that in real life they only attended I believe 3 races out of the possible 10, so, so that's going to be interesting. And of course in our case Honda will be there for the entire season. So this should be a pretty interesting season. Now before we move on I'd like to thank everyone who took part in the straw poll as well as everyone else watching these videos and subscribing to the channel. It really means a lot to me. I'm still a very small channel but one day with your help we might reach a decent size. That's the dream at least. But for now I'm more than happy with what I got. So once again thank you for supporting my channel and with that said let's have a quick look at the 1964 Formula 1 season. The season started on the 14th of March and ended on the 12th of December. It was comprised of 18 races, 10 of which were part of the World Championship whilst the remaining 8 were non-championship events. The season was won by John Sturtis who scored a total of 40 points but only won 2 races the entire season. Graham Hill ended the season in 2nd with 39 points 
move or 41 if we are to account for the dropped points. And he also won two races. Jim Clark finished the season in third with 32 points and scored three victories along the way. So that's what happened in the drivers championship. Now let's take a look at the constructors championship, which was won by Ferrari. They scored a total of 45 points or 49 with the drop points and won three of the races. BRM finished the season in second scoring 42 points or 51 with the drop points and won two races whilst Lotus were third they scored 37 points or 40 with the drop points and they won three races in all. And before we move on I'd like to say that unlike 1963 which remarkably saw no fatalities at least none that involved a Formula 1 driver 1964 wouldn't be that merciful because 1964 claimed the life of Dutchman Karel Godin de Beaufort during practice for the German Grand Prix where his car veered off the track and crashed sustaining severe injuries. He died a couple of days later in hospital. And on that grim note let's have a quick look at the 1964 Monaco Grand Prix. It was held on the 10th of May, it had 23 entries, 17 of them took part in the race, however 7 ended up retiring. The race consisted of 100 laps completed in 2 hours, 41 minutes and 19 seconds. Jim Clark started the race from pole with Brabham in 2nd, Graham Hill in 3rd, John 34th, Dan Gurney 5th and Peter Arundel started from 6th. After a superb drive, Graham Hill won the Monaco Grand Prix from Ginther who was one lap behind Graham. Arundel ended the race in third, he was three laps down. Jim Clark retired from the race on lap 96 with an engine failure, but was classified in fourth. Joe Bonnier crossed the line in fifth, he was four laps down. And Mike Hillwood rounded off the top six, he was also four laps down. Graham Hill was the fastest man of the race, posting a lap time of 1 minute 33.9 seconds. Greeting from the fabulous Monaco circuit where a lap starts off with a short sprint into turn one a fast right hander that takes us up the hill and into Massanet a medium speed left hander which leads into Casino Square a medium speed right hander which has a bump right on corner exit so be very careful. Next we come into Mirabeau a slow right hander that takes us down the hill and into Station Hairpin one of the slowest corners in Formula 1. From here we move on to Portier a slow right hander that leads into the tunnel a unique feature of this track. Then we come through Port Chicane the most dangerous dangerous corner of the track by far. Next is Tabak, a medium speed left hander, care should be taken through here as letting the car go too wide could end horribly. Finally we reach the last corner of the track, the gazometer, a tight right hand hairpin which brings us around onto the main street and that is a lap around the Monaco street circuit. And here we are in Monaco and I've just skipped uh, the qualifying session because if you remember from last time the AI is absolutely very very slow on this track and well uh, as you can see they it took them almost three seconds to complete the lap anyway Bruce McLaren starts from pole with Graham Hill in second Jim Clark third Jack Brabham fourth Dan Gurney fifth sixth is Ludovico Scarfiotti followed by Mike Spence in seventh eighth is Richie Ginster then we have Joe Siffert in 9th, followed by Peter Arundel in 10th, Andre Pilat is 11th, Hapsharp 12th, 13th we have Bernard Colomb, followed by Maurice Tintignan in 14th, 15th is Giancarlo Baghetti, followed by Peter Revston in 16th, 17th is Tony Maggs, John Taylor 18th, 19th is Frank Gardner, followed by Phil Hill in 20th, 21st is Karel Godin de Beaufort, Gerhard Mitter is 22nd, 23rd is Edgar Barth and Andy Higgs is 24th obviously because we didn't qualify again. As you can see some people took almost 4 minutes to complete the lap. Uh, that would have meant that I would have been at a great advantage. Anyway, here we are for the start of the 1964 season, the Monaco Grand Prix, kind of a uh, iffy start on my end uh, I was kind of trying to figure out what the clutch was doing I couldn't but eventually I got going so that's cool as we come into turn one here Sun Devot be very very careful AI already screwing up and move up into 19th as we come into mirror uh, Sun Devot here going up the hill towards Mustanet. Hopefully we can gain a couple more positions that would be very 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 good as we have a look at a replay of the start. Again we can see I'm quite slow off the line but then I figure out figured out what was going on and got going so 
lost a bit of time but not all that much and by the time we got into turn one there I even managed to gain a couple of a couple of positions which is absolutely fantastic that's what you need a I would really like to do as well as possible in this race uh, the end of 196 the, the end of the 1963 season was quite disappointing as we come now through Tabak here heading towards the gasometer to finish lap one and Tony Max is out of the Grand Prix which means we move up another position I believe and here is a replay of Tony Max coming into the port chicane kind of uh, shallow there uh, hits the entrance to the port chicane and flips his car upside down as we come out of the gasometer here to start lap two and I've just been overtaken by two cars and we're down in 18th however not not soon after that I coming through some devote here I passed three cars which were moving very slowly through the corner not quite sure why but we move up into 16th which is fantastic and we are now chasing after Frank Gardner as we move now on to lap 3 and Frank Gardner is very slow through coming out of Massanet there and I almost overtake John Taylor as well through Casino but I couldn't quite make it stick as we now go down towards uh, the station air hairpin and, and we take a look at a replay of Ludovico Scarfiotti and his Ferrari who comes around the gasometer and uh, pretty much phases through that wall and is out of the Grand Prix. Next we have a replay of Joe Siffert coming into the Portuguese hits the wall on the exit there and flips his car upside down and there he is we see him as we come around ourselves racing towards Tabak and trying to overtake Peter Refson at this point we are in in 12th place so that's quite nice hopefully we can gain a couple of more a couple more positions a points finish would be absolutely fantastic I'm trying to get around Peter Refson however he's kind of uh, flaming all around here I break a little bit late into the corner and coming out of the corner I almost overtake Peter Refson however he seems to be much much faster than me on the straight not quite sure how that that's possible however as we come into Sandevot he slows down a whole bunch so does Hap Sharp and we move up into ninth place now chasing after Andre Pizet in the Equipe Marsbergen uh, sorry Equipe Shiroko and up front as we take a look at a replay of Dan Gurney coming through Portier and driving off the map phasing through the walls and here's a replay of Bruce McLaren who did pretty much the same thing he comes through Portier and I'm not sure but uh, I don't think that's how walls work I'm pretty sure that's not how walls work anyway here we are on lap 4 I just overtook Filet on the inside through the station hairpin quite tight there and we're now chasing after Richie Ginster who is in 7th in front of us actually he was just overtaken by Bruce McLaren but then Ginster again falls down to 7th and we move into 5th place now coming into lap 5 and chasing after Richie Ginster who is right or Mike Spence I'm not sure what's happening the game is kind of freaking out and is not sure who's where and why anyway I make a move on the inside of Mike Spence and we move up into fourth place on lap 5 which is absolutely fantastic next we have Graham Hill about seven seconds up the road so hopefully we can catch up to him as well and we do indeed up about halfway through lap 6 as we come through Mirabeau and down into the station hairpin and we have a replay of Jack Brabham coming through the port chicane he hits the entry to the chicane and flies into the yacht and out of the race as we come around the final corner on lap 7 here and we overtake both Graham Hill and I believe Peter Arundel yes However, Peter Arundel ma manages to overtake me on the straight, but then slows down significantly coming into the Sun Devot and I move back up into second. Only Jim Clark and is between us and the lead of the race, so hopefully we can catch up to him soon enough. And indeed we do on lap 8, coming out of Sun uh, Devot there and we move up into second. However, as we reach Mastanet, he manages to slip bias once again but I stick on the inside coming into the casino square and 
we move up into the lead of the Monaco Grand Prix which is absolutely fantastic news for Andy again especially coming out of 1963 the 1963 season which was absolutely well it ended quite horribly for Andy and we see a replay of Peter Arundel coming through Portier and driving off the map there again I'm pretty sure walls don't wall uh, work like that but anyway we now move on to lap 9 and we are slowly pulling away from Jen Clark which is something that we want obviously we need to put as much space between ourselves and second place and we just saw a replay of Mike Spence coming out of the gasometer and phasing through the wall and out of the race uh, this is starting to be quite an interesting race uh, as we now move on to lap 10 and continuing to pull away from Jim Clark again that's what we want as we take a look at a replay of Hap Sharp in the number 23 car who comes around the gasometer, phases through the wall and well obviously retires from the race lap 11 now and we've caught up to a bunch of slower cars and we make quick work of them hopefully we'll be able to make quick work of the following group of cars as well uh, that's pretty easy and we now have a replay of uh, Trevor Taylor or John Taylor I should say coming through the gasometer there and driving off the map as well we move on to lap 12 now getting around a bunch more slow cars and continuing to pull away from Jim Clark and we have a replay of Richie Ginster coming through San Devot here and he gets collected by actually I think that was Andy Higgs but well he was quite slow so I didn't really have I was kind of on a mission. Anyway, he moves, uh, turns back around. He tries to drive the other position, the other way, and ends up driving off the map. As we now have a look at a replay of Karel Godin de Beaufort, who drives up off the map as well. And here is a replay of Edgar Barf, who crashes into the port chicane, flips his car upside down, and is out of the race as well. Moving on to lap 21 now. Uh, I've managed to lap Jim Clark at some point, not quite sure when, but I did, so that's fantastic news for Andy. This this means that we are on point to win the 1964 Monaco Grand Prix. We take a look at a replay of Jim Clark, who surprisingly comes out of the gasometer. However, he doesn't face through the wall there, however, he gets stuck. As we take a look at a replay of Andy Higgs coming around to finish lap 22 and post the fastest time of the race so congratulations to Andy Higgs as we now move on to well we are still on lap 22 now continuing to pull away from Jim Clark and we have a replay of Andre Pilet coming through the gasometer in his yellow car and once he phases through the wall however he somehow is spat back up flipped upside down and he is obviously out of the race as well and here we are on lap 23 I've just overtaken a slower car coming from Mirabeau down through and into station hairpin where I break a little bit late and end up in this runoff area I then try to uh, put my car into reverse however for some reason the engine died on me when I did that and that is the end of the race for Andy Higgs absolutely disappointing start to the 1964 Formula 1 season this is not what Andy needed as we have take a look at a replay of that again I break quite late coming into the corner I end up on this runoff area I try to come back out of it try to put the car into reverse however for some reason that ended up in the engine dying on me and well we are out of the Grand Prix unfortunately not a not a good way to start the season this is quite disappointing especially since we were in the lead and had such a beautiful lead such a huge lead on Jim Clark who just unlapped himself as we take a look at a replay of Gerhard Mitter coming through the gasometer going wide uh, phasing through the wall and he is out of the race as well as we now move on to the fin final lap of the race and for some reason 
the lap ends quite quickly there as Jim Clark cro crosses the line to take the win of the 1964 Monaco Grand Prix. Congratulations to him. And here we have the retirement. Unfortunately, we number ourselves among them, which is, again, disappointing. And that's the 10th time I said that in the span of two minutes, so I probably should stop. But yeah, that was the Monaco Grand Prix, not a very good start to the season. And I am repeating myself again, which is not fantastic. That's not good commentary. So I should probably end it there and move on. So here are the career statistics. And this was Andy's 122nd Grand Prix. His best start is from first, has eight pole positions, has set 17 fastest laps. His best finishes in first, has completed 78 races, 62 of them in the points, has won 36 Grand Prix, four at the Indianapolis 500, six in Monaco, has seven championships under his belt, has scored a total of 421 points, has retired 44 times, has experienced 2,000 642 out of 3,282 laps, has 6 bronze trophies, 13 silver trophies, 36 gold trophies and as an extension, 36 podiums. And here is a quick look at the championship standings. Clark is leading the championship from Peter Refson who is second, Bernard Colom in third, Marie Cintina fourth, Giancarlo Baghetti fifth and Frank Gardner is in sixth. The only other person to finish the race was Phil Hill and everyone else retired. So that is a quick look at the driver's standing. Now let's have a look at the constructors and here we have Team Lotus leading the championship with Peter Refson in second, Bernard Colom third, Marie Cintina fourth, Cuderia Centrosud fifth and John Wilmont Automobile in sixth. So that was the Monaco Grand Prix once again a very very disappointing race for Andy and I am repeating myself again but I'm I guess I'm so disappointed that I cannot help but point it out how disappointed I am I guess. Anyway our next race is the Dutch Grand Prix at the fantastic Zandvoort circuit a circuit I very much enjoyed so hopefully things will go a little bit better there. It looks like the Honda has quite some pace in this season, especially considering that the AI is very slow through corners for some reason. I'm hoping that's only a problem for Mo Monaco and not the rest of the season because that would be quite odd. Although, considering that they are much much faster on the straight than me, I guess it kind of balances out in the end. But anyway, that is the end of this video. Not much more to say about any of that because I'm pretty sure I will start repeating myself. So yeah. You can already vote for next season's team if you want to have a say in what team and the Higgs will be driving for in 1965. So if you want to do that, there will be a link in the description that will take you to a straw poll to uh, enable you to do that. I also have a second channel where I will be playing all sorts of different games. At the moment, I'm doing a playthrough of Homefront and the Red Solstice. So if you're interested in any of those games and more, there will be a link in the description to my second channel as well. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Thank you all so much for watching. And as always, stay sharp.